Hi, everybody. I'm Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke. I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual focus conversation, which this year is on love, grief, and belonging with award-winning and best-selling author Colin McCann. Each summer, we assign incoming first-year focus students a book. And this year, it was McCann's 11, 11th book, The Beautifully Observed, A Paragon. This book was actually my first lockdown book that I devoured on my first day of lockdown here in Durham. I absolutely loved the story, the friendship, the dignity of the two individuals as they managed unfathomable loss. I then proceeded to share it far and wide before we decided to select it as this year's reading. For those of you unfamiliar with McCann, he is the Irish born um, author uh, who is now one of the world's most foremost storytellers, moving seamlessly from the troubles in Ireland to Romani camps of Eastern Europe to the dizzying heights of the World Trade Center. Known as a writer of style and substance, hailed by critics and readers alike, he is known as a poetic realist and a literary risk taker, a writer who was known to tackle the dark in order to get through to the light, any sort of light, however compromised, on the far side. He is a recipient of many awards, including the National Book Award for Let the Great World Spin. This was actually summer reading here at Duke for all incoming students probably about a decade ago. The book was an allegorical story inspired by the events of 9-11 and set up around Philippe Petit's tightrope walk between the two towers in 1974. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Esquire, The Paris Review, Granta, The Atlantic, GQ, Tin House, amongst other outlets. He wrote a short film, Everything in This Country Must, which was nominated for an Academy Award in 2005. McCann is also co-founder of the global charity Narrative 4, led by artists, ed educators, students, and community ad activists, including Terry Tempest Williams and Ishmael Bey, Greg uh, Khalil, Asaf Gavron, Tyler Cabot, and Marlon James. Narrative 4 brings young people from all over the world to walk in one another's shoes. It is an act of radical empathy, says McCann. You can tell my story and I tell yours. This is what we call at the Keenan Institute moral imagination. From Newtown, Connecticut to Belfast, to Kentucky, to Tampico, Mexico, from gangland kids in Chicago to the streets of Limerick. What storytelling does is that it increases the lungs of the world. After the exchanges, these young people go back into their communities and begin to alter their worlds from the ground up. We're looking to develop a generation of truly empathetic leaders. Um, this is a goal very much akin to the mission of the Keenan Institute itself. Narrative 4 has facilitated the sharing of over 48,000 stories across 20 states and 12 countries. In today's conversation, I'm hoping we can do three things. First, to talk about a paragon, um, then to talk about Narrative 4, and then writing as a vocation. But before we jump into the conversation, I wanted to uh, make a note about logistics. Um, I will chat with McCann for about 40 minutes before we open it up for questions. Please send your questions along through the Q&A mechanism and folks backstage uh, will tee them up and send them along my way. Second, Zoom uh, is beset with a myriad of challenges always. Please do know that there are a variety of folks working backstage, if you will, uh, to address any technical issues that might emerge as they often do. And with that, let's just get rolling. Welcome. Great. Suzanne, how are you? And hello to everybody there. And um, hello to all the focus students. And, and, and I gotta say, can I just, I, 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 I've been studying for the last couple of days what, what, what you guys are doing there. Um, I think it's phenomenal. Um, and I'm sort of humbled that um, uh, the students and you and everybody else would 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 engage with this um, with this piece of work. Um, and um, I, so I thank you for it. I thank you for the chance to 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 to, to talk to these uh, 
to these shapers. And the word fiction actually means to shape. So they're, 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 they're maybe the fiction makers um, of, of, of tomorrow. So thank you everyone for being, for being involved and I appreciate it. So great. Um, and with that, why don't we just jump right in? Um, and maybe you can tell us how you first heard the story of Rami and Bassam. How did, you, how did you come to this story? Um, and what were your first reactions upon hearing it? This was a pretty phenomenal thing. So I'd written a book called Transatlantic, which sort of investigated the peace process in, 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 in Northern Ireland. And um, what happened was that, um, um, you know, I uh, was talking with the, actually Senator George Mitchell, and he had been special envoy to the Middle East. And he said to me, sort of tongue in cheek, if you think um, Northern Ireland was difficult, you should go have a look at the, at the Middle East. And, and as it happened through Narrative 4, I wanted to, to, to go to the Middle East. Um, and I went there with a group of activists and artists, including my co-founder, uh, Lisa Consiglio. And um, we went around and for 10 days and my heart was blown entirely open by, you know, we met Palestinian rap stars, we met Israeli artists, we met people from the Knesset, we met people from, from, from mosques, from synagogues and uh, from all sorts of business backgrounds, creative backgrounds. But on the second to last day, Suzanne, um, I went into a little town called Beit Jala. It was raining, four o'clock in the afternoon, a little bit cold. And we went up this rickety staircase and two men were sitting there in this room. Uh, one was named Rami, the other one was named Bassam. I didn't think anything much was going to happen. And within half an hour, sometimes happens, as, as, as the students know, uh, something can happen that, 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 that cleaves your, 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 your life uh, wide open. They told me the stories of how they, one an Israeli, one a Palestinian, had lost their daughters um, to what, you know, some called a conflict. What, you know, there's all sorts of language difficulties here when we begin to talk about, about this, but, but the human element of them, these two men talking about these daughters, their, their, their daughters and bringing them alive. So, so to me, it was like a, a Scheherazade moment. Um, you know, Shahrazad being the main one of the main characters in in, in the Thousand and One Nights, and she tells her stories over and over again to keep herself alive. Well, Rami and Bassam, these two fathers, were telling the stories of their two daughters in order to keep the girls alive. And I thought, what a phenomenal thing! And then I went back to New York and I said, well, I can't do this. I, I, what right do I have to do something like this? Um, you know, I'm born in Dublin, you know, I, I, I've, I've traveled around, but I live in New York and I'm sort of middle class. I'm a, you know, I'm a white writer and, 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 and how can I go in there and engage with this? And this was a, 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 a sort of struggle for me. I'm, I'm very acutely aware of the ideas of cultural appropriation, and, 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 but also acutely aware of the ideas of cultural celebration too, which is interesting to me, where you go in um, into a story or into a place, or into a heart, or into a head, or into a, a Zoom box um, with your head bowed, uh, saying, I don't know. Uh, I am confused. Uh, I would like to know. I would like to increase the lungs of my culture by engaging with your culture. I would like you to teach me. Uh, and that's what I tried to do and tried to set about doing for the next uh, couple of years. I spent uh, almost uh, four and a half years uh, working on the novel, got to know Rami and Bassam as brothers, uh, literally, like, like they, they feel, feel, feel like brothers to me. I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to, uh, to Jerusalem and Jericho. And um, all, all, all you need to know is that they, that, that they are extraordinarily courageous people. Um, and uh, when I heard their story, I, it, it, it felt to me like, uh, it was a story that I'd heard billions of times and it was completely individual at the same time too. And I knew that I had to try to engage with it. That was my sort of moral purpose as, as, as a writer to take on something that perhaps uh, might, uh, you know, knock me off balance and, 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 and potentially also uh, knock the, the, the reader off balance, which I think all good texts do they sort of disturb us um a little bit uh, the function of a good poem or the function of a good class or the function of a good conversation down in the restaurant or whatever it happens to be is to throw people a little bit off so that they come back and reconsider and rather than, than tell people how to think 
sort of, uh, I like the word allow. I like the word allow very much to allow people uh, to, to, to discover uh, what they knew, but weren't necessarily entirely aware of in the first place. And so uh, were you trying for the reader, uh, right, to allow them to have that experience you had in that room? Or were you trying to do something else there? Right, I, there's such a, right, it's such a beautifully told poignant story. And um, it's, I feel like the, the book was really much more for me, at least an experience and not just a read, that I, I was so moved by the structure of it and the friendship between them. Was that what you were trying to do for others or were you doing something more than allowing others to share in that experience you had? You know, here's the thing, and, and it's kind of a secret, but, but, but um, and, and, and sometimes people don't believe, but, but, but writers a lot of the time don't know what it is that they're doing. You know, um, and, and, and you go in and you're operating on a wing and a prayer and you're hoping that somehow uh, you're going to do a couple of things, whether you're going to uh, um, yeah, recreate the experience that you had when your heart was your heart was broken or you're going to allow people access to a different form of engagement with uh, an issue that maybe they didn't know uh, all, all that much about or to inspire people to create uh, new art, different art, and uh, I, 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 I will just like this, this will only take like fifteen seconds. But I had it, had it open because, um, uh, you know, what I was trying to do, what what I do in the book is is, is there's a um, thousand and one sections, go from one to five hundred, and then five hundred down to one. But in the in, in the second to last, um, or, or in the middle section, a thousand and one. It just says, on an ordinary day at the end of October, foggy, tinged with cold, to listen to the stories of Bassam and Rami and to find within their stories another story, a song of songs, discovering themselves, you and me, in a stone tiled chapel where we sit for hours, eager, hopeless, buoyed, confused, cynical, complicit, silent, our memories imploding, our synapses skipping, in the gathering dark, remembering while listening, all of those stories that are yet to be told. And in that section, basically what I'm saying is to, 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 to the reader, um, you are in this with me. You are as much the creator of this book um, as, as I am. And one of the things that I, I, I did early on was I had to acknowledge um, some of my own confusion in, in relation to um, what is going on in, 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 in that part of the world. And the first 25 pages um, are sort of deliberately confusing. They knock you around. Your, your head is bouncing from birds to weapons to Francois Mitterrand and all these sort of things. Um, and you know that was deliberately confusing because I wanted to engage the idea of uh, confusion. One of the things that I think it's important for us to talk about when we talk about ethics, when we talk about moral purpose, uh, when we talk about you know these things that, that you guys are confronting head on, is the ability to say um, I don't know, the ability to say uh, I'm lost, the ability to say I'm confused, the, the ability to say please teach me, um, uh, the ability to go in and say we contain multitudes, as Walt Whitman uh, would have said. You know, I am large, I contain multitudes. Um, and sometimes these multitudes like, like, like grind up against one another and they don't necessarily fit in some, some sort of like neatly prepackaged um, uh, fiction, if, 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 if you will. Um, and that's one of the things that I loved about Rami and Bassam, uh, because just like you, like me, like everyone else, like the, they're complicated um, and, 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 and sometimes contradictory. Um, and, and I'm sure your students talk a lot about the ability, the grace of holding uh, contradictory ideas in the palms of your hands at the exact same time. Um, the, the humility that's, that, 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 that's necessary there, uh, a little tinge of arrogance too, perhaps, uh, you know, and the, the, those two things coming, coming together, how can, how can those two, 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 two things um, go together? Well, they do. Um, they become they become the kaleidoscope through which we 
we actually see see the world, which is what to me what a good education is about. So, I, was it challenging to get them right to to get to know them sufficiently that you felt that you could celebrate them and their story well? So, how did you how did you go about that? So, you hear the story. What happens next? Like, how do you? Right? Like, what do you say? Do you go back to them and say, I'm thinking I want to write a book. Uh, yeah. Let's talk. Or, right? like, like, what does that conversation look like? That's exactly what I did. That's exactly what I did. I mean, look, uh, we had a connection that first day. I cried my eyes out. Um, they tell the story sometimes three, four, five times a day. They told the story already tens of thousands of times. I thought that they were speaking it to me for the, for, 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 for the very first time. I realized afterwards, no, they told, tell it over and over and over again. And then I went to them and said, you know, that's extraordinary. I would like to recreate that for a reader so that they're hearing it for, 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 for the very first time. I said, I want to write a book about you guys. And they're like, okay. And I, okay. It's like, uh, and, and, and I was like, you know, they said, well, we, we, we talked to lots of journalists. We talked to lots of people. We've had films made about us and so on. And I said, but, but, I don't think you understand, uh, you know, I want to write a fiction. I want to, I want to imagine your lives. I want to imagine your hearts. I want to imagine your souls. I want to, I, I want to make things up, actually. I want to like make things up that they're so that they're even more truthful than, uh, you know, than, than, than what you present uh, to the world. And that was uh, something they also said, okay, fine. Because guess what? Anything, I could have said anything. I could have done anything. Um, but, uh, you know, they have, they have paid the ultimate price and their life is all about the message that they want to get across. And they felt that if any part of the message got across, that we need to know one another, we need to make the leap into one another's lives to have that, 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 that empathetic um, life. Now, not talking anything political because there's lots of political stuff that goes on underneath that's turbulent and 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 very mysterious about these uh, two men and their own engagement with their own cultures but fundamentally at the human heart level if i could get people to understand that uh, they are telling a story about two girls that could have taken place in durham that could have taken place in the Bronx, that could have taken place in Belfast, uh, and two fathers who were supposed to hate one another. Um, and all the available evidence lies in the notion that they must come to blows with one another, and they don't. Um, and, 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 and they start to see the world in a radically simple way. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, then when, when, when I got into that, um, you know, and then I would go across and I went with Rami on his motorbike. I went with Bassam through the checkpoints, you know, uh, I had dinner with them, uh, met their families, hung out, walked in the hills, did all these things. Um, and um, still they trusted me. Um, and, and, and they love the book. And, 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 and uh, uh, Bassam is now reading it because it's coming out in Arabic. Um, Rami read it only after it, it was published. Um, and it seems to me a tremendous act of bravery that they allowed me to go ahead uh, and, 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 and take this on. But I think part of them knew that nothing could hurt them uh, because they would still go on to say their message. But, they were, but, but now they feel that the message was actually, yes, articulated uh, in the book. So th I, I'm curious about that, right? So. Um, this is not the first time you've sort of fictionalized a, a real life story. So one, one question I have is about, right, why that's a, right, um, an approach that you have, but also as, right, as storytellers, right, who are telling their story in various places over and over again, that I'm, I'm surprised that the fictionalization of it didn't bother them or that they didn't have some sense of ownership over that. And um, it just seems extraordinarily, right, sort of a incredibly gracious act for them to say, take that. And right, was there, were you worried about that? Did that make you anxious or how to, how to be faithful to that, to people who had entrusted you with something extraordinary in that way? 
you know, I've never said this, and it's just as you asked the question, I, I just realized that to me, because of my own background, they're saints. And what they chose to do was to was to, was to lose everything but their story. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 that's what that's what they ha would have done. They would have given away everything in some sort of Franciscan ritual, mm -hmm. uh, except their story. And 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 um, uh, it surprised me. Yes, that they would that, that they would allow me to do things. But 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 I think there, there's something very important here, and and it, 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 it's quite difficult to convey. There's a difference between the, the absolute factual truth and, 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 and the assemblage of facts, which can be sent off in a mercenary way to do whatever work you want the facts to do, and a textural truth. Um, and the, sometimes they come up against one another. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, so facts can be, be, be manipulated, but true texture, love, pride, pity, compassion, sacrifice, all of these different things um, can't be manipulated um, in the same way. So, uh, for example, uh, in, in writing this book, um, and a very simple example, and there's, there, there, there's several examples, but a very simple example is that Rami rides a motorbike. He rides it fast. He's 70 years old. He does all these things. I was on his motorbike. I used to ride a motorbike myself. Went through Jerusalem with him. It was great fun. But um, he called me when he was reading the book. He said, listen, this is all great. I love it. I love it very much. But you got me on the wrong motorbike. And I'm like, I know I got you on the wrong motorbike. He said, well, why did you do that? Well, the thing is, Rami drives an automatic. And to me, the automatic was fine, but it was boring. It, 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 it didn't put the reader onto the motorbike. So I wanted the word clutch. I wanted the word gear. I wanted the word movement. I wanted to, like, to propel the person, the reader through so, so that she or he is actually feels like she's on the motorbike. Um, and and, 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 and that's, a, that, that, that's a falsity, but it's a deep truth because you get onto the motorbike. The other thing is that the men had never met in the monastery. Here's a, here's a Jewish man coming from Jerusalem. Here's a Muslim man um, coming from, from, from Jericho. They're meeting at a monastery, a uh, Christian monastery in Beit Jala. The Christian monastery is there. They have been to the monastery. They've done all these things, but they never spoke together um, in the monastery. But it felt to me entirely true that even if they didn't, they did. Um, and, 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 and that it communicated something to the reader so that the reader would feel it in a visceral and profound way. So that sometimes, um, you know, my, my, my late great friend who, who you probably knew and, and, or know and met and certainly read, uh, Frank McCourt uh, from Limerick who wrote Angel's Ashes, he, Frank would say to me, he says, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But I, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to be facetious about this because I'm really serious about it. Um, I feel that this book is entirely true to Rami and Bassam. They both feel the, sa the same way too. And their families have been extremely good about it too. But it's a controversial book. It's getting into territory that people don't necessarily like. And these men are not supposed to like one another. So what is it in them? that vaults them through that human experience and, 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 and allows them uh, to, see, uh, to see one another. And it's not necessarily about, this is not necessarily a balanced book, you know, and, and people who haven't read it criticize it because they think it's a balanced book. Um, there is certain amounts of balance that are going on. There's stories one to 500, there's two, two people. But, you know, uh, Rami is um, Rami's a left-wing Israeli. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is a, a you know an outlier uh, already um, in 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 society. And he's saying things, you know, when Rami and Bassam go to schools in Israel and Palestine, or Israel in particular, um, people get upset. They don't want Bassam to pass through the gates. Bassam is so quiet. Oh my gosh, I wish you could meet him. I wish you're. I wish we could go. We'll, maybe next year we'll go to Duke and we'll we'll we'll, we'll just we'll all be there because they are amazing amazing I mean and their sons by the way their sons were a little older than 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 than, than, than the, the focus students now but 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 they're, they're you know they they carry on that tradition they go around because they believe that the force of storytelling has the force of you know that the storyteller a story can shape 
the world. Uh, and and uh, stories can do a lot of things. They can take your life away. They can take your reputation away. They can be dangerous, but they can also be beautiful and in the proper hands, in skilled, proper hands, they can work miracles. And I think that Rami and Bassam work miracles by um, telling this story uh, over and over and over again, uh, because they go they go to they go to a very dark place and they bring back some light, just like you said in your introduction. That's so generous, by the way. But they go to a very, 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 very dark place and somehow manage to gather up in the palms of their hands some light to scatter around around the rest of us. So how do you think um, they come together? So one of the things um, we did this fall at the Keenan Institute, we had um, a class and a series organized around friendships. Right, and really trying to look at an Aristotelian notion of friendship and how it can be transformative and that uh, friendships offer a possibility for social change that's really just extraordinary. Um, it, right, is your sense that they came together, right, that, that loss created a space right, a humility, uh, an opening for them to come together that they would not have otherwise been able to. And, right, and is that, right, a mechanism for that kind of coming together of people who never would otherwise? It's, it's awesome. yeah. Air, devastation, that, right, that kind of common denominator of what it means to lose a child. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant question, and it's the question really. Um, look, both of these men are huge weapons. Rami had been involved in three wars. Uh, Bassam had gone to prison for seven years for tossing uh, dud grenades underneath a, a tank. He became commander of the Fatah unit while he was in prison. He saw a, a, a documentary about the Holocaust. He came out changed. I think that they both. How do I say this? I think that they both realized that they could eventually use their grief as a weapon and and and, and they had used weapons before and they and, and and they saw how useless weapons could be but this weapon of grief uh, as you say loss created a space for them to use the grief and turn it into some sort of positive force which takes some sort of like huge uh you know, like 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 sense of forgiveness and understanding but listen you know you talk to 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 to, to rami he, and he will say i didn't see palestinians before all this i couldn't see a palestinian i saw a man who mowed my lawn i saw who, my man who fixed my fridge on a saturday or whatever else it happened to be i couldn't see them and then suddenly i saw this woman one day stepping off a bus clutching a picture of a dead child and she was clutching all that grief and, that, and, and, and he suddenly recognized that their grief was, I mean, that was universal. Um, uh, and again, not necessarily balanced, but that was a universal thing and it cut him to the core. Uh, and then both of them looked at each other and they realized, uh, you know, that they, they, they could do things uh, with this grief rather than, you know, go back and turn justice into revenge. Because justice gets turned into revenge in so many parts of the world. You see it, I've seen it in Northern Ireland, we see it in like the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the streets you know, of New York, whatever else it happens to be. But if we can, if we can learn uh, to, to try to attempt uh, to turn justice into something less than uh, revenge, uh, then we're already doing something. So that's, uh, that, that, that's what, 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 um, what they did. And by the way, they're so, they're so fun with one another. And also their sons are fun, fun with one, one another. The one thing they want to prevent, Suzanne, is they want to prevent their grandchildren um, having to do this too. Now, is it possible that they can prevent this? Let me tell you something, like uh, I grew up like in the 1960s, 1970s, you know, early 1980s in Ireland. And, and there was no way when I left Ireland in 1986, after the hunger strikes, after all these things, there's no way that you could have told me that we, we would have peace um, in, 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 in the North. And um, now we have it 22 years after the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, it's shaky and all these things, but, 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 but the impossible occurs. And this is the thing. And this is the thing that the students have to know. Um, that, 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 that sometimes you work and you work and you work and it seems entirely impossible, but 
for whatever reason, walls fall and they fall very quickly. The Berlin Wall fell very quickly. Peace does not necessarily come dropping slowly, as, he, as Yeats might have said. Sometimes it comes with the force of an axe, but it takes uh, people who, who have done a lot of grind work beforehand. And, and it seems to be that our generation that we have right now, uh, these young people who are, who, who are part of the focus cluster and, 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 and other students you know, all around this country, you know, if they can access this energy, uh, this energy of change that's random and crowdsourced and, and turn it into something emergent rather than having power structures from above come in and tell us how it is that peace should occur or how it is that politics should occur, that there is a power in, 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 in what's happening and what can happen in universities. Um, if it's done with the knowledge that, uh, you know, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and, and sometimes it just seems like nothing's going to occur. And then suddenly, boom, something occurs. And that's fantastic. So what do you think, Ray? Um, you know, clearly your work with Narrative 4 and your, and your own writing is, right, trying to, in some sense, subvert um, and create those openings and possibilities for change. Um, Ray, can you reflect a little on fiction in general and the, and the role you think it plays um, for us as a society to think about those mechanisms and levers of change. And um, do you think we rely on fiction enough or too much? Um, like what's the, what's the work of fiction toward the common good or creating a common good? I don't believe in the word fiction. Um, I, I use it. I use it all the time because it's convenient and I use it because um, you know, it works in the Library of Congress and it works in my local library and so on. Um, but I don't believe that there's a huge gulf between fiction and nonfiction. But I think what, what, what we're both saying is that storytelling is the, the, the thing at the heart. And if, if, if it didn't sound so pretentious to parties and whatever else it happened to be, people say, what do you do? Well, I say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a storyteller. But that sounds sort of vaguely mystic that you're hanging out by the campfire, you know, and doing all the, you know, roasting your marshmallows and doing whatever else it happens to be. But no, um, fiction and nonfiction are sort of braided, braided together. And what it comes down to is storytelling. And storytelling, um, as we have learned in Narrative 4, is the most democratic thing that we have. It goes across borders, boundaries. I don't care where you're from. I don't care you know, uh, you know, what sort of background it happens to be. We all have a story to tell. Um, there's no Olympics in the idea of storytelling. You can't necessarily tell a better story than the other person. The story touches upon these elemental things about the about the human spirit, and that's what's really, really, really beautiful. And 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 you know, death will take away a lot of things, but it will not take away our stories. You think about your grandfather. You think about your mother, your father. You think about people who maybe you've lost. You still have stories to tell about them. And in, in, in a certain way, it's our stories that legislate the world. Um, now, the problem is that, 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 that some people manipulate stories. And also the problem is that, that we don't trust some of our stories enough. But like, for example, in Narrative 4, I'll just tell you very quickly, because, um, you know, um, so we brought these young people together from the South Bronx, uh, the second poorest congressional district in the United States and Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and, and, you know, these kids here are primarily black. These kids here are primarily white. These kids are immigrant here. Or, 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 uh, there were some Cherokee students here, but primarily blue here, quote unquote, primarily red here, primarily urban here, primarily uh, rural here. And when they came together, they were, they were actually scared of one another. They might not understand that they might not understand one another. But when they told a personal story, when they told something about themselves, about why I wear a hijab, for instance, in the South Bronx. Well, I like I like to wear a hijab, says, says uh, you know, one of the young girls, because it hides my, my, my AirPods and I can listen to music while, I, while, while, while I'm in school. And you know, oh, why do I have a hunting rifle, says the young boy down in, 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 in Kentucky, because my family's poor and I need to um, I need to feed my family hunting rabbits. And suddenly things become complex. Suddenly things are not as simple as, oh, she is different to him. They both have purposes and, 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 and they come together. And in storytelling, we break down the divides. We bridge uh, with one another. I believe that in this whole 
you know, area of that, that, that you guys are plowing so beautifully, you know, when we talk about ethics, when we talk about moral purpose, when we talk about those things, that, that, that storytelling is one of the absolute fundamentals uh, uh, of it. And, and that it hasn't been recognized enough that personal stories, not you know, stories that are uh, didactic or anything like that, uh, personal stories are the things that, 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 that can actually like, um, make us much more dappled and speckled and much more interesting uh, as Americans, as you know, uh, global citizens. Um, and, and, and so I think that's where the purpose lies. So how did you get the idea for Narrative 4? Where did that um, come from? I didn't get it. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I, in, in certain ways, I'm a follower. My, my co-founder, Lisa Consiglio, um, she was running a, a literary organization in, 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 in Colorado. Um, she had the idea, she had the vision. I mean, still, it's still her vision. Her vision right now is that she wants to eventually be in, 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 in every school uh, in the world. And I sort, of like, I sort of like sit back and say, but, but uh, I, I know that that's, um, that that's a vision to have, that one must have uh, that sort of vision. So I have, have been instructed, I learned from my fellow writers who were involved, you know, Terry Tempest Williams, Ishmael Bea, uh, Lila Azam Zangane, uh, Ruth Freeman, all of these different people, Marlon James, who I believe did a lecture with, with, with you guys a couple of years ago. Um, you know, all, all of us are together in this uh, because we know that storytelling um, is incredibly important and we want to bring storytellers into the classroom. But the students are really important and the storytellers are really important. But my heroes are the teachers. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't think there's a place in America where democracy asserts itself so uh, incredibly profoundly as in the classroom, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways. But and there are like some schools that, you know, have, have you know, that are private and do all these things, but fine. But but in certain classrooms and in a lot of classrooms in this country, democracy is, you know, very much uh, on display and it is. Uh, the teachers who are the legislators or the custodians of that democracy. And gosh, do I wish that, would, that, that, that they would get paid better, you know, the primary school teachers, the secondary school teachers. Uh, gosh, do I wish that they could walk onto airplanes first class as well as military people, all this sort of thing. I mean, that's one of my, one of my things. Gosh, do I wish that we, you know, uh, would, you know, treat them as new heroes. And maybe under a new administration, we'll, we'll, we'll start to see that in certain ways. But um, I do think a lot happens in in the age group for us. We're, we're talking about sixteen to eighteen year olds primarily, uh, and those teachers help uh, make the link between students, then and uh, and the artists. Great. One question about narrative four. So, it can anybody tell a story? Or is there, right, is storytelling an art form that, that takes a particular shape? Um, when you work with students, is it about them, you know, sort of crafting their own story? Or is this more, you know, I think of the work of something like the Monty here, which is sort of a craft of storytelling. There's a way to tell an effective story. Is that part of it or is it, more focused on the story and the empathy that's generated in the interstices between stories. I'm so happy that you asked that question because, you know, um, the thing is that 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 that, that um, you know, it doesn't like anybody can tell a story, and, and so our our thing is that the, I tell my I tell you my story, you tell me my story, and then I get back in the group and I say, "Hi, my name is Suzanne," and yeah. I tell your story. So I'm making like a double story. I'm not only I'm telling my story, but I'm also telling yours the same. So the brain, uh, when it tells its own story, is like a circus and there's lights going off. But the brain, when it tells somebody else's story, is like a carnival or, or multiple carnivals going off all, all, all at once. Um, sometimes people can get that story wrong. And, and, and that's a learning lesson too. This is not all sort of kumbaya and, 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 and oh, oh, I'll tell your story, you tell mine. Sometimes people can, can, can not hear. So it's also about listening. Um, and, and, and so while, while, while we talk about like story storytelling, uh, fundamentally what it comes down to is the act and the art and the generosity uh, of listening. 
but also forgiving people for not getting your story correct. You know, we're in a country right now that is not getting each other's story correct right now. Um, and, 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 but, but we at least have to try because we've come indoors and we put these like walls around us and we put these doors and close the curtains and said, this is my story and, and, and I'm the only one who owns it uh, and, 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 and don't come near it. And I don't want your story to intrude on mine. But really what we have to do as a nation, especially in this country of all places, is that we have to acknowledge how much it has to like, 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 like uh, you know, mix together, how, how kaleidoscopic um, it has to be. And, 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 and so one of the things that we have to do as org nonprofit organizations, as universities, as teachers, as students, uh, is engage in that complexity. And the, the real disease right now uh, is the disease of certainty. I am certain, I know, I know the truth, you know, this, 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 is the, this is the one way and the only way. And that's so boring as much as anything else. You know, certainty is just friggin' well boring. Um, and what, what, what I like to see is some sort of like, you know, sort of poetry coming back into it, some sort of doubt coming back into it. As you said earlier, going, walking into a room saying, Jesus, I don't know. Can you teach me? I'm stupid, uh, you know, or, or, or I'm, I'm ignorant of this, but I'm not so ignorant that I don't want to learn. Um, and that's, um, you know, if, 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 if we can sort of re-engage with, 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 with that sort of idea, then we'll be doing some, doing, doing some good. Okay, great. I, I want to talk a little bit uh, with you about, you know, Colin McCann as a writer, um, for those students who may be themselves aspir as aspiring writers. So um, is, is writing your calling? Huh. Is, this, is, is this your purpose? Colin McCann as a writer is pretty boring, actually, you know, like I get up in the morning and I uh, like, uh, you know, I do a bit of work and I walk the dog and maybe go for a run and then go back and do a little bit more work. And uh, um, but the stories that I want to tell are not boring because um, I really want to engage with the with with with, with the world um, in, 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 in certain ways. Was it my purpose? I mean, I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be a journalist. Yeah. Um, and uh, then from, from, from journalism at the age of 21, which is what a lot of your students are, you know, even under that right now, um, uh, I um, came over to, to the States to, um, to try to write a novel. I failed miserably, Suzanne. I mean, I can't tell you how miserably I failed twice. It, the, the stuff I wrote was so bad. That, I mean, you. I mean, it, your students would, would 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 laugh at it. But what I did then was I, I I did something weird. I did something that didn't compute in the large sense of things. I got on a bicycle and I spent the next year and a half traveling around the country, meeting people, uh, going from place to place, riding about fifty miles a day, uh, sleeping out in my tent and sleeping bag, and 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 that's when uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the democracy of storytelling. That's when I realized, oh my gosh, everyone has a story to tell, and it doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, and they don't necessarily have to craft it. Yes, I know there are some organizations out there that want to craft stories and they tell you how to win and influence people, and they're great, and God bless them. But you know what? The ragged story is just as good as the perfectly crafted one, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and sometimes even more powerful. See, people will tell you the most gorgeous, intimate of things, you know, uh, and, um, you know, so uh, it's, um, it's it, it, when, when it comes to stories and storytelling, I just think, uh, you know, I learned a whole lot by doing something that doesn't, that, that, that didn't necessarily uh, compute in, in people's minds. They're like, what are you doing? You have a degree in journalism. You should be like working in a newspaper. You should be getting, uh, you know, medical insurance and uh, all that sort of stuff. And instead, I got—I I was lucky. Um, you know, I had time to get out there and do something, do something a bit, um, a bit off the wall. Um, and I think everyone should do that, whether that be joining the Peace Corps, or joining the army, or um, you know. Uh, joining, going out to Guatemala and working with, with with people, or staying in Durham and 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 and, and you know, engaging in something that they weren't supposed to do because you will learn so much by getting out of your track. 
Um, and I think that's that, that's one of the things about, you know, what, what when we're talking about philosophy, when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about and, and these sort of things, that when you knock yourself off balance, when you're in the wrong sort of area for a little while, or the supposedly wrong sort of area, you can learn so much uh, about yourself and uh, uh, about others. So that when, when you return or when you don't return, you'll be able to use the power of that to, uh, you know, to change things that are around you. So I kind of, I, I really like that thought in a way that there are these, when you're off balance or in, in particular challenging moments that, that that's when magic can happen. And it's interesting because in, in my reading of the Rami Bassam story, it's that grief that decenters them and enables them to come together and, and do what they do together. So I find that super, super interesting. They, you know, one of the things um, when, especially students are thinking about what they wanna do in this world, being good at something really matters. Um, was there a point at which you said, you know, sort of after you started these conversations and had this revelation that storytelling was this incredibly democratic form did you say and damn i'm good at this like what at what point did you say damn i'm good i, I whenever i finish a novel i'm pretty convinced that i can never write another novel uh, i'm pretty convinced that people were going to say well he's a charlatan or he got away with it this time uh, and you know because i'm empty when i finish a novel i'm completely empty and i don't think i'm going to i'm going to be able to do it again i do at this stage think i'm going to be able to i'm going to write for the rest of my life but 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 um there are times i get so terrified um people think that writers are assured about what it is that they, that, that, that that they're going to do and what it is that they want to do and their themes and so on no 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 and and and, and we feed off of them um, our our um um, you know, our, our readers. In fact, I, I bet you that, 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 that there, there are interpretations of a paragon amongst the students, because I find that young people are really healthy readers of this book, because it's, it's a weird book, right? It's told in a thousand one sections, but it sort of reflects the consciousness of the internet in certain ways. Um, and I bet there are, certain, there, there are certain people who have theories on this book, uh, that, that would make this book much stronger and much healthier and, and more intelligent for me. I'm an emotional person. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm a musician. I, I, I'm making music. With this book, I felt like I was a conductor. It was like, okay, I'm gonna get this one going here and this one going there. Um, and I wanted to make a, you know, a, profound, a profound music. But ultimately the most important thing was it was true to the stories of Rami and Bassam. These are the, 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 the these are the people who, who who really matter. And guess what? There are Ramis and and, and Basams in, in 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 Durham for sure. They are all over the place. They are on there. They're they're on the campus, but they're all peppered all over our country too. Um, and we have to tell these stories over and over and over uh, uh, again. Uh, and 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 recognize them. Um, but this is not an a necessarily um, unusual story. Um, but it has the profound impact because one's an Israeli, one's a Palestinian. They are supposed to hate one another and they put their heads on one another's shoulders and they, 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 they say, we got to go forth into this world and tell the story of our girls because uh, otherwise, if we don't know each other above ground, we're going to end up knowing each other six feet below ground. And I do not want to know you uh, and I do not want to have to engage with, you know, uh, you know any sort of violence whatsoever. Um, and that, that's what was um, profound about them. Great, so uh, the questions have started to roll in. So let me um, start teeing them up. So the first question is really about the pandemic and how you're continuing to connect to people in the pandemic. Sounds like you travel a lot. Uh, how are you encountering new stories uh, with constraints of this moment? Well, the pandemic. Um, all right. The one one of the things that I realized in the middle of the pandemic was that 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 um, we were, or certainly I was, entirely meaningless. Uh, I would look down on myself, and 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 look at myself and say, you know, I, you look so meaningless. You're one of seven billion uh, out there, and and you're like there are seven billion molecules bouncing around, and yours is a tiny molecule in, of existence. Um, 
And, the, you know, it just seems not to have an impact whatsoever. Your stories don't have an impact and all these di different things. And yet, at the exact same time, I also realized that uh, my life and your life and everyone's life was so meaningful at the same time because it mattered what you did. And for the first time in a long time that I can remember, um, the individual was making a public act that actually mattered. So wearing your mask mattered. Standing six feet away mattered. The way you went into the grocery store actually mattered. This was sort of an unusual revelation for, 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 for people. And so to have those two things to be, for me, to be meaningless and meaningful uh, at the same time was, what was incredibly important and made me think, uh, to, 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 to the person who answered the question, made me think a lot about stories and storytelling. Um, it also made me think an awful lot about the local and the universal or the local and the global, the global, as you guys probably uh, pro probably engage with it. I like the idea, um, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that the, the local is the universal, but the walls have just been taken down. And, and so in so many ways, you can find the universal in the local. You really can in a tiny, tiny little moment, you know, like, 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 you know, uh, you can find, you can find the universal, but you can also find the, the, um, the opposite going on as well. So um, it seems to me that when you guys talk about global citizens, you don't have to be a globe trotter to be a global citizen. You don't have to be engaged with, you know, uh, every other culture or to know the news from other cultures. You have to be aware that there are other people in the world. You can be Emily Dickinson living, you know, in, 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 in isolation, and yet you can be a universalist, um, you know, at the same time, you know, uh, and, and, and that's really interesting to me. You can be in, your, your, your house in, 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 in uh, whether New York or Dublin or, or Durham, and you can be a global citizen. Um, and it, it's not necessarily about, it, it's, it's about looking at corporations. It's, it's, it's about looking at art. It's about looking at all these different engagements, it's about criticizing power, uh, taking control of your own power, questioning also your own existence and your own power uh, and, 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 and all of these things. But to be a global citizen means to think, I think, you know, it means to be the, the, that, that person who's prepared to, you know, go beyond the easy cynicism of, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we're all we're all one. And you know, that doesn't work, uh, you know, to get in there and to be to, to be properly cynical. So this pandemic um, has been tough, but it's taught us a lot and, 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 and some great poet will come out of it and she will, some Greta Thunberg will come, 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 come out and she will sort of like, like open our eyes to whole new ways of possibility because of it. Great. Uh, the next question um, is about the power of stories, um, which you've spoken a lot about. And the question is whether there's a difference between stories that do good and stories that do harm and how do you tell the difference? Oh, wow. How, how many hours do we have? <laughs> um, look, it, it, it's really interesting to me, the, the, the difference between evil and, and good. For, for, for evil to exist, it only has to happen once. For good to exist, it has to happen over and over and over and over again. In other words, good, goodness is much more difficult and then, then evil happens to be a bullet for or a bullet to occur. It needs only to occur once. For some sort of healing to occur, it has to go on and on and on and on and on. That's why the force of what your students are confront, confronting right now is actually much more powerful than what's happening necessarily, say, in the business world or, 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 or in other places, because they're actually they're actually under pressure for this to happen over and over and over again. Now, in relation to, to, to stories about, uh, 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 about good and, and, and evil, yeah, stories get manipulated. Um, stories can be um, 
but, but we have to have the storytellers there who are going to call out the manipulation. We also have to have the citizens there who call out the manipulation and say, no, 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 that, that, you know, that's not true. And this whole word about being true right now is really interesting. So it's an interesting place for, for an artist to be, um, to be talking about what's true and what's not true because there's so much going on that's not true, but then elementally, there, 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 there are these fundamental human truths about beauty uh, and engagement and, 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 and all of these sort of things. Um, but if I would say anything to, to, to the students, if they could recognize that what they're doing in the moral sphere is actually much more difficult uh, than, 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 you know, um, than, than so many other paths that they could take. And that difficulty is excellent. And that difficulty is actually something very, 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 very beautiful. That's great. I love that. Um, here's another question. Um, what gives someone the moral right to tell other people's stories? And is the protagonist's permission to tell that story sufficient? Right. And I think this applies really well to your conversation about Rami and Bassam. Yeah. So, right. Did you feel morally authorized? Did you feel you had that right? I didn't feel morally authorized until I was far enough in um, and I felt that, that I was telling the truth. Um, I, you feel uh, morally authorized by being, by, by, by being honest. Um, but, but also like when I wrote the book and, 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 and finished the book, I gave it to Rami and Bassam, but I also gave it to their families. I also gave it to dozens of Israeli readers, dozens of uh, Palestinian readers, you know, uh, tried to shape it and, 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 and get it right. And my question was, who else is going to do this? I mean, are we going to have an Israeli writer go in and tell the story of an Israeli and a Palestinian? No. Are we going to have a Palestinian writer go in and tell the story of an Israeli and Palestinian? Well, no, maybe, yeah, perhaps. But um, it fell it, 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 it fell to me. But also, I didn't feel like I was actually the storyteller. I feel like Rami and Bassam were the storytellers. Uh, I was a conduit to, through which they, 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 they allowed that story to go out into the world. And as I say, they, they tell it over and over and over again. And for me, I just felt like I was a tuning fork. Uh, you know, I was a human tuning fork, and I listened to them, and 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 and, and I resonated at the, the at, at the, the, the 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 best possible time. I hope, um, if I got it wrong, I got it wrong, um, and I deserve to be called out on it. Uh, I don't believe I got it wrong, and I would I, I would argue with, and Rami and Bassam would too. But 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 it's this is healthy. This is. You know, when somebody says, well, you're colonial in your attitude or you're anti-Palestinian in your attitude or whatever else it happens to be, I think this is really, really, really healthy um, because we can talk about it as long as like it, it, it doesn't become vindictive or, you know, those sort of things that, 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 that can occur uh, with powers and uh, stories. But this is such a good question. Good versus evil. Uh, and what sort of right do you have to go in uh, as, a, as a storyteller? And as I said earlier in the conversation, I believe in cultural celebration. Uh, and that means a good dose of humility going in saying, I don't know, please teach me because you're gonna make my place a better place by teaching me, you actually have the power. So, you know, assert the power upon me. So you use the language of a tuning fork, which I, Ray, is just, I absolutely love that metaphor. Um, is, do you think that in other works you understood yourself to be playing that particular role as a tuning fork? Or was there something particular about this story for you? Um, you've described it, right? In, in this story, you were more of a conductor. Um, it, why in this instance? It, it, it was for me, um, and, you know, you know with, with, with this particular story, um, you, know, um, you know, I went in and, and, and I knew that I was uh, treading into dangerous territory. Come on. I like, okay, uh, you're going into Israel, Palestine, one of the most supposedly intractable conflicts, um, you know, and um, you really don't know all that much about it um, to, to, to begin with. And you're, you're attempting to capture the souls of these two extraordinary men and their daughters and their families around. Um, this is 
this is tough stuff um, to to go into, but um, uh, I I felt it more than than I was conscious. I was acutely conscious uh, of what it was that I wanted to do, but I also had to lose myself to the music of it. And that's why the book is like, like the book sort of destroys the idea that I have to explain everything to you, like area A, area B, area C, you know, no, look, you have to know area A, area B, area C, they exist, but, but, but you don't necessarily have to know them yet. If you know the territory of these two men's hearts or their, 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 their daughters, then later on, you'll get back in and you'll, you'll, you'll study area A, B, C, and D. And, and, and then you'll bring, begin to, to break down some of the, that, 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 that uncertainty. My, 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 my role was to throw a spanner in the works um, and, uh, and to stand up and say, hey, I'll take it. You know, you want to throw it, you want to, you want to criticize me for it, I'll find, I'm, I'm learning to practice what I call an intellectual Aikido now. So, so, so like when, when it comes at me, I just sort of like, and, and, and silence. And I sort of embrace, I know I've been talking a lot now, but, but most of the time I just sort of embrace uh, um, silence and, and, and um, with, with, with this sort of stuff. In the same way that Rami and Bassam actually do, even though they tell stories over and over again, there's a great moral, uh, uh, strength in what they don't talk about too. Good. Um, next question is about polarization in the United States. Um, and so in the US right now, uh, right, there's a news landscape. People listen to very, very different stories. They're consuming different stories about the very same things. How do we move beyond that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, how do we move? That's that. That is the great question. I mean, I do think that narrative four um, and organizations like it, uh, like the Keen Institute and other places, like the, the, uh, we have to we have to go in um, to these places and, and 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 say this is this is messy, and guess what? It's okay for it to be messy. Um, you know, we are not as stupid as our political parties want us to be. And we are not as stupid as our TV stations seem to want us to be, or our commercial advertisers or our corporations, or even our artists seem to want us to be. Um, you know, we deserve more than that. So, 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 so calling for, um, you know, recomplication, calling for nuance, and in fact, just scuffing things up in your own neighborhood, uh, you know, re-nuancing things in, 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 in your own neighborhood is going to be one of the things that we do. That's why this is such a profound question. I mean, um, well, this book, A Paragon, is about is, is, is as much about, you know, uh, you know, here in the United States as it is about um, in, in, in Israel and Palestine. And guess what? The same sort of stuff. I was just in Ireland recently. And the same sort of stuff is happening um, in Ireland. Um, and we... Uh, I think we have a, we 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 have a responsibility to get out there as teachers and, and 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 students, and to say this is so much more complicated than you're allowing it to be. And God bless the complication. Let's have some more of it. You know. Okay, great. So the next couple of questions are sort of turning back a a, a little bit, um, and the first one is, what are you reading currently? What's on your nightstand? What would you most recommend to someone in the audience right now of okay. something you are reading? Uh, well, right now I'm 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 doing a preface for um, a poet um, by the name of Jim Harrison, so um, who died a few years ago, and 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 uh, I'm reading all of Jim's poems. Um, but I have so many books on 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 my nightstand. I think it's a really healthy time. Uh, there's a lot of diverse voices coming. If you look at the Booker long list, Booker short list, and like people, you know, um, the short lists for 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 uh, you know lots of things that are going on. Walk into the bookshop. Walk into your local bookshop, please. Um, and 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 uh, because that's that's where we got we we got to go. We got to look after those and ask them for 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 voices that they think are new and that voice might come from nigeria or might come from 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 mississippi or might come from like 5 miles away down 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 the road um i'm reading a lot of exciting stuff from uh young women in particular uh who are like like really pushing the boundaries of 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 fiction stories and storytelling um and i i i love to see that uh, i'm not going to 
pull up any names because I know that I'm gonna I'm gonna forget uh, like the, the the ones that I really should should be talking about. But um, seriously, uh, you know the other people I really enjoy hanging out with. And I, I was lauding teachers earlier, but librarians and booksellers know a lot of stuff about what's going on in the world, and they love to tell you, uh, you know, read this book or don't, you know, read this other book, and 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 that's the best way to to go in and expand expand the lungs. I will say this, can I just say, uh, one of my favorite writers is Ariel Dorfman, who's right there with you guys. Um, and um, Ariel wrote uh, an incredible book uh, earlier this this year called The Bus. Uh, and he also wrote a children's book. Um, I think it's called The Rabbit's Rebellion. Anyway, uh, Ariel is, a, a, is a, one of those, the, 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 those, those great writers uh, who I, um, I feel blessed to be um, in, in in touch with so, but but in general, I just say to anybody, uh, yeah, go into go into your bookstore and and, and ask ask ask. So, uh, following this theme, is there a book in your uh, biography that you think was pivotal in some way? Can you could you identify a book that you're you know it's your touchstone that you come back to or that changed your thinking in some significant way? Okay, I'm going to tell you about a book that I promise you that nobody's ever heard of. And it's called Goals for Glory. And it's by a man by the name of Sean McCann. Uh, so my father was a professional soccer player. He played for Charlton Athletic in London. When he came back to Dublin and began work as a journalist, he began to write a series of soccer books. So when I was six, seven, eight years old, uh, he was written, writing these kids' soccer books. The first one was Goals for Glory. And he would have me uh, read them for him. Uh, they were eventually published and, 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 and they did very well. But I will never forget when the book eventually got published, uh, my, my, my teacher in St. Bridget's School uh, up the road uh, read it aloud to the students on a Friday afternoon if we behaved ourselves. <laughs> and I remember when Georgie Good, the hero of the novel, uh, scores the goal in the very final chapter, the winning goal. The guy in front of me, uh, Christopher Howell, like redheaded kid, uh, jumped up on his desk and started like dancing like this, and like and 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 I, I was amazed at the power of fiction, um, because here was something that came out of my dad's crazy head and his experience. Uh, that he wrote on a like an old typewriter in the shed at the back of our house, and then suddenly, um, because of that, there's some kid is jumping up on the desk and 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 celebrating fiction. And I think something. I don't think I was conscious then, Suzanne. I mean, I don't think I, I, I you know, I, I knew it then, but I think that had a big effect on me because I, I think I, I could see then the power of of of, of, of the, the the imagination or of storytelling. Um, then another book I have to say, and I don't want to sound pretentious, and like, but 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 Ulysses is an is 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 an enormous book for me, um, and uh, I just do feel that it's a compendium of human experience and the greatest book of the 20th century, if not the greatest novel uh, ever, um, and uh, it had a profound effect uh, on me. But but basically every book I read. Uh, I get something something else from. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the end. Oh, um, here's one final question. Oh, maybe more than one final question. I'm not queuing them up appropriately. Um, what's the relationship between social justice and storytelling? Do you think stories have been important to the social movements of 2020? Um, also, how does one read well? So maybe can we can, can we can 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 we separate can we separate uh, those uh, read okay because those are two and maybe they maybe they are the same question but 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 like wow the relationship between social justice and storytelling I think it's absolutely incredibly profound. Um, I think these things are word linked. I think they're action linked. I think they're linked by empathy. I think they're, they're, they're linked by desire. I think they're linked by necessity. 
And when I think about like social justice, just purely on, a, on, on, on the basis of, say, what happened in, 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 in Northern Ireland, right? Um, and, 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 you know, growing up in Dublin, my mum's from Derry, I spend my summers in Northern Ireland, you know, I see a lot of stuff that's going on. I, 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 I know some of the people who are peripherally involved in, 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 in what's going on and, and in social justice movements. But, you know, so much of the social justice movement in Ireland and the civil rights movement in Ireland was based on what came out of the African-American movement in uh, the United States. So Stokely Carmichael, Miriam Makiba, you know, like, like all of these people were, were, were important heroes. The, the, the hymn, We Shall Overcome, was sung on the streets of Derry, uh, you know, and, and we were, we, we, in Ireland, we came after the, 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 that movement. We, we got inspiration from, from that. So the stories that were told about the American uh, movement uh, uh, absolutely affected what was going on um, in, in, in Ireland. And you have to have a poet, uh, it seems to me, and you have to have writers and you have to have artists and movie makers, um, as well as the people who are out on the street uh, as proponents of, uh, of, of, of social justice. I mean, I do recall how Seamus Heaney had a part you know, in, in, the, in the poem Ceasefire and, 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 and the care with which he took about talking about, uh, you know, what was going on in Ireland. Benedict Kiley, Edna O'Brien, people like that, were, were, they were telling stories. Um, and so these things work, 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 work in tandem uh, with one another. So this, the, the, this um, symbiosis between um, social justice and storytelling uh, is uh, phenomenally important. And not just in looking back, because a lot of time we look at social justice movements and we get people to tell the story afterwards. But telling the story in the present tense somehow, and, and, and I, I believe that, that, that most of the young people who are on this call will understand that because they, you know, there, there's something happening in the present tense, but let's tell it in something more than Twitter. Let's tell it in something more than 120 friggin' characters. Let's tell it in something that, 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 that like more expansive than, 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 than some sort of weird, uh, you know, like like if you could write a haiku in 120 characters, great, and you get some. But 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 we don't. We, we're not telling haikus in 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 our twitters. We're 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 forcing ideas down each other's throat. There's some way that storytelling can be adapted uh, to augment and reinforce and celebrate uh, what's going on in 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 social justice. So that's that's incredibly important. How does one read well? Ha. Huh. How does one read well? I don't know. You just give yourself over to the story. You, uh, you believe in the story, and 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 you hide yourself away, and you turn off your phone, and you you know you 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 uh, you read this book, and you you um, are prepared to criticize it, um, and also prepared to you know be confused. Um, I love this idea. This like uh, like that. You can go into a book and not necessarily know what to say. Don't expect uh, anything simple. That would be the way to read well. Um, like celebrate the fact that you get like confused. That would be a beautiful way to read uh, extraordinarily well. Celebrate the fact that you even after you've read the book, you still don't know half the stuff that you should actually know. Uh, and 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 I, and I think if we if we could acknowledge that, then we'd be much healthier. Wonderful. And with that great advice, I think we're going to call it a conversation. So uh, can I just say to you, thank you so much for this opportunity to anybody who read the book. Uh, like, thank you for engaging with the book. Uh, anybody who didn't read the book, thank you for not engaging. <laughs> no, but no, seriously. Um, like I, I, I do feel that in our colleges and, and uh, at, at, at this particular time, we have a big responsibility to one another. And that responsibility comes in, 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 in really trying to understand one another's uh, contradictions. And uh, when I looked at you know, your website this weekend and we're like engaging with the things that, 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 that you're doing, I think it's 
pretty phenomenal. And so let's keep on doing it. And, and thank you for giving me the chance to speak. So this was great fun. Um, and for people who haven't read the book, you really need to. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye now. Thank you.